I am simulating a racing drivetrain, a racing car drivetrain. So this particular car is a four-wheel drive with viscous differentials front, rear and center. And I'm thinking that maybe there are some things in here that you haven't thought of before. So I hope it will be interesting to you. The first scenario is this. We have two scenarios. The first one is with perfect traction and then with one wheel spinning. So with perfect traction we have an engine with a torque of 100. I will talk about the input maybe. T is torque. I is a momentum of inertia. M is mass. Gearing. R is radius. W is angular velocity uh, V is velocity and this is the bias front rear so with perfect traction and a torque of 100 in the engine we would expect that the sum of the torque on the drive shaft would be also 100 but we have a gearing of 2 so the sum of the drive shafts are 200 which makes sense, right? And we had the rear wheel drive bias of 0.6, so we expect the rear shafts to have 60 versus 40 on the front. One and two are front wheels, three and four are rear wheels. So we have a 60 40 ratio as expected from here. So this seems all cool and right, yeah. But it's too simplistic. This is not really what's happen, happening in a drive train when a car is accelerating. So this is an accelerating car. I'm not talking about a clutch start here. I'm just talking about an accelerating car. So why is this not uh, accurate enough? Uh, among other things because there is an inertia to the engine and the flywheel that we haven't counted for so if we increase the, the set of zero now this is the flywheel and the engine crankshafts and the connecting rods and pistons if we set this to an effective value of 2 and run the simulation again you will see that the sum of the torque on the drive shafts will no longer be 200 they will be somewhat less never mind the magnitude of the difference 2 might be too big or too small it's just a number showing the effect but the effect is real you will certainly feel a heavy or a light flywheel in a car so now the sum of the drive shafts went down because we must also accelerate the inertia of the engine. That makes perfect sense. You could feel that effect is not negligible and it should therefore be simulated in a high quality simulator, in my opinion. But we still have the rear uh, front to rear ratio of 0.6, and the values are what you would expect. If you know how this works uh, and also the sum of the force on the wheels so this is the ground force on the wheels that makes the car accelerate it's now lower so the acceleration will be lower how much was the acceleration before it was 3.3 and the force on the ground was 666 the number of the beast <coughs> <clears throat> and now from 3.3 to 2.3 and from 6.6.6 to 4.6.1 because we have an, a heavy flywheel that we must accelerate uh, but this is also not accurate enough I am simulating all four wheels individually and the wheels by themselves also have inertia because they are quite large and quite heavy so they also have inertia that inertia have been set to zero up till now 
So let's set also some inertia on the wheel and see what's happening. We had four, six, one here and one, three, eight there. So now we had from four, six, one to four hundred. So the force on the ground went down. But the sum of the drive shafts torques went up. Did you see that? That's <clears throat> so we had one three eight four six one. One three eight four six one one four six four hundred. So things are certainly changing because we are accurately simulating also the inertia of the wheels. These are not crazy numbers these are not maybe exact or but they are ballpark numbers that are not 100 times wrong or 10 times wrong they are somewhat close to something nowhere near exactly but they are not crazy so these are these are real effects these are real effects uh, so why did this happen why did this go down but this up, if the torque on the drive shaft goes up, we would expect the force on the wheels to go up also. But that's as I explained before with the flywheel and the engine. The inertia of the wheels steals some of the torque, because we must also accelerate the inertia of the wheels. So this went up and this goes down because some of the torque goes into accelerating the inertia of the wheel uh, but still why did this go up all of a sudden how come we got more we can accept we can ex we can understand why this went down even if this went up we are still to explore why this went up this went up let's see because let's see. right so look now omega dot this is the acceleration angular acceleration of the engine is 15 here angular acceleration of the engine is 15 now when I add inertia to the wheels the angular acceleration of the engine is 13. The angular acceleration of the engine went down. Meaning, there is less force required to accelerate the flywheel. Meaning, we have more force on the drive shaft. So there are a lot of subtle effects in here because of the inertia that I think should be simulated in my simulator. Right, so that's some of the effects we have. Let's now try to set this back to, now we have no inertia on the wheels, and we set this to four wheel drive. So now we have a rear wheel bias of zero, meaning we have a four a front wheel drive here. And this force is the same. That one is back again to 138. But this is zero as we would expect. The drive shaft and the force of the rear wheel are now zero. But now we are not simulating the inertia of the wheels so if we again put some inertia back into the wheels can you guess what's going to happen take a second guess what's going to happen boom this is what's going to happen we've got a negative force on the On the wheels 
even though we have a zero, still have a zero drive shaft torque. Where does this force come from? It comes from us needing to accelerate the wheels when we accelerate the car. These are now not driven since it's a four wheel drive, a uh, front wheel drive car. But the car is accelerating and we must also accelerate the wheels. So that's why we have a negative force here, as one would expect, giving it a little bit of thought. And this one says now negative. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, oh, let's put 0 0.6 back and see. Alright, so now we have 0 0.6 is the ratio between the torque of the drive shaft. But you see here we have 0 0.62 is the ratio of the forces on the front and rear. So this is the rear to front ratio of the forces. These are front to rear of the uh, drive shaft. So even though we have set it to 0.6, that is for the torque on the drive shaft, because some of the inertia, some of the torque is lost in the inertia of the wheel. Shouldn't there be equal amount of torque lost because all the wheels are similar? Yes. But the forces have different magnitude because of the torques have different magnitude. So this is correct. This is one thing that actually happens. So now let's see in the second scenario where one wheel is spinning. So I have set one wheel, the force of one wheel is now 36, it's just a number smaller than the other numbers because this is on a slippery patch, this rear wheel is on ice or clay or something that's slippery. <coughs> so there is a lot of effects because of this. We have a smaller total force and we have a lower acceleration but we have a larger acceleration of the engine because this wheel is spinning up faster. You can see the acceleration of this wheel is a lot faster than that one. If this one, if this wheel is spinning of course it's going to spin up. And when that happens, if we have no inertia on the wheels, it will be crazy numbers here. It will not be simulated properly at all. I haven't actually tested this, but this should be almost crushed. Let's test this out right now, live for the first time. Um, I don't even have that number down here. <coughs> yes, I did, but I didn't see it. Right, what will happen? No, that's not the right number. I am, I am blind and stupid. Why did I start messing with this now? 75. Yeah, so that's really, really fast. But why isn't it faster still? Because we still have the inertia of the engine to accelerate. So we still have some inertia, right? Still have some inertia. Right, now we have no inertia. That means it crashed, as I told you. 
this would be crazy. So you must have inertia if you are going to simulate this in a proper way. Otherwise, if you do tricks, you can do it anyway. But we are not doing tricks. We are doing this properly. Right. Small excursion. And we are back to seeing what's happening with one wheel is spinning. So I have viscous differentials I can play with. Now they are set to zero here. This is the front differential and since there is no spinning on the front wheel it doesn't matter what this number is. But these are set to zero and this is the center dip and this is the rear dip. So let's increase the rear dip and see what's happening. So now this number went up to 148. Before it was 106, lower than it was with perfect traction. Uh, but still quite high since the torque required to spin this wheel up as this acceleration makes us have quite a lot of torque is still on this side but if I increase the stiffness of the differentials you have even higher force on this wheel now even higher than it was before and again these are due to inertial effects of the engine and the car accelerating at different ratios than they were before and also I can increase the stiffness of the center dip so now we have a lot of force on the front wheel and very little force on the rear wheel this went down significantly now and that is because the front and rear propeller shafts must now have about the same speed because of the stiffness of the center dip. That means this these crankshafts and these wheels can't spin up and there are less inertial effects to compensate for that. This is getting quite complicated so I should stop now. I have already gone too deep but I hope I have shown you that the inertial effects are real and significant and that I am also simulating them properly thank you for watching this not so tidy video